Welcome to Oak Forest United Methodist Church. We're glad that you are worshiping with us this morning. Um, just a few announcements. Is this uh, Wednesday? We're asking that by this Wednesday that if you have any Thanksgiving donations for our food pantry to bring them by then. And also to know that we have our food pantry this week. Last time we served 69 households, so we're expecting to see a little bit more this next time as well. Um, we're also going to be having a relaunch meeting uh, coming up tomorrow, and we'll be continuing to look at what's going on in our, in our state with COVID numbers and making those decisions to make sure that we're worshiping in the most healthy and safest way possible. And so we'll be sending out information after that meeting this week. And I think that's all the announcements that we have for events and different things coming up. And just a reminder to remember to keep your mask on during all times during the service and to make sure that you're socially distancing. And then after the service, when you're invited to leave, we'll be dismissing by the rows, and then we'll have you guys go out through the parking lot. And we ask that you continue to remember those rules of keeping masks on and to keep your distance from one another. But let us turn our hearts to God in worship, and let us pray. Holy Spirit, we are thankful to be in this place. We ask that you continue to be with us and allow our hearts to be focused on you. Take our anxieties and allow them to clear away so that we are able to hear your good news today. for prayers over those who are sick and ill, those who are 
home today who can't be with us, all those who have lost loved ones during this pandemic, all those who have been ill themselves. But Lord, we are also praising you for this beautiful day, for the sunshine and for the warmth and peace that you put around us during this time of change. We give you our love, our hopes, our fears, our tears, and we lay them down, Lord. We know that we don't carry the load alone. And we remember these words that you've taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. I've got a home in glory land that outshines. The sun. I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. Way For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, 
Though I neither fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow bothers me, I will vindicate her, or she will wear me out by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says, and, he, and will not God vindicate his elect, who cry to him every day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will vindicate them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us be in a time of prayer. Holy Spirit, I pray that you come and fill us with your word, and that these words will be made yours. Allow our hearts to hear your good news. Amen. So it was a few weeks ago, or maybe longer, who knows anymore what timeline is, and um, Chase and I decided, you know, we kind of miss going to the movies. So we decided, you know what, after Charlie's in bed, we're going to watch a movie. And so we got a bowl of popcorn, and then we decided, let's just really make this like the movies. So we turned off the lights, and everything's really dark. We're like, the only light in the room was the TV. And so we we're starting this movie, and all of a sudden we hear a noise. And we look over, and of course, because it's dark, it's a little creepy, all of a sudden there's just Charlie chilling there off to the side, trying to watch the movie with us. And so we pause it. We're like, okay, Charlie, it's time for bed. And we take a bath and put it back in bed. And we start it up again. We're like, all right, we're good. Like, we got this. And then we hear another noise, this time from this side of the area. He had stuck around the other side, through the kitchen into the living room, and is trying different toys. And um, he walks in, he's like, what's she eating? <laughs> it's like, now he's never going to go to bed because here we are. It's like a party to him. And so after several times of this, we start the movie again and we start laughing because it had been like 45 minutes since we had started this movie. We were only in 15 minutes of the movie on the screen. Mm -hmm. So whenever I think about persistency, I think of toddlers often. They are not going to give up. And I think that's a good example of that in our own lives or those around us, those people that you know, that they just aren't taking the hit. They're going to keep going. And so when we think of the story, we think about those kind of things. And so when we look at the story, it's really, you know, a time where it's like, you know what, we're just tired. I'll allow it. We almost wanted to fold and say, yeah, Charlie, let's just watch a movie all together and we'll wreck the day together tomorrow. But at the start of this parable, Jesus says the message loud and clear, to always pray and not give up. However, if we look a little deeper into the story, we can learn a lot and kind of understand maybe more to this story than just that. So now Jesus makes this even more interesting because when we look at this story, it's really about a powerful man who's used to getting his own way versus a really vulnerable woman who's used to submitting to power and authority. And we look back at biblical times, we have to understand those roles of this time of being a widow and a judge. Now, being a widow is considered to be an extreme hardship because often there was a lot of ways that they weren't able to provide for themselves. And inheritance laws were that if she had no family willing to take her in, there was kind of no other support system. And so she was left to kind of fend for herself, which could be a very desperate state of affairs in that kind of society. Now, with that understanding, the widow was probably a little older, was poor, maybe weak, and would have no stature in the community at all. Now, for the judge, Jesus says there was a judge in a certain city who neither feared God nor cared about people. So let's imagine what kind of person that would be, to not have a fear of God and to not have a care for other people. He must have been somewhat of a tyrant, maybe full of self-pride and arrogance. Think about all the power that he wielded, and probably he was feared, and he was used to getting his way. Jesus knew what he was doing when he told this story. He gave us two people that were completely different contrasting views of one another. And yet Jesus says this widow kept coming to the difficult judge, begging on his door, pleading, grant me justice, grant me my request. 
And for a long while, the judge refuses to even acknowledge or answer her. But she persistently and tirelessly continues to come, banging on the door and making her request known to the judge. And at this point, the judge finally says, this woman keeps bothering me, so I'm going to see that she gets justice because she's wearing me out with these constant requests. And so the bottom line, that helpless yet persistent widow finally got what she wanted from the all-powerful man. We have to realize, though, that even though we have these ideas of the biblical widows in place, that doesn't mean that it's accurate about all widows in that time. Maybe not all of them were poor, not all of them were helpless, obviously not, since she was able to save herself. As well as there's those social safeguards that hopefully those in the community would be there to help carry her. But when we have that stereotype of others in that mind, then we're setting ourselves to have a preconceived idea of who the righteous one is in this story. Now we have no idea from the scripture of her economic status, nor what issue was at hand, what she was wanting to be corrected. We just know her plea is that she goes to the judge seeking out vengeance. So we really don't have a good sense of her character. And once we stereotype her, we can ignore, though, the challenge of this parable, and maybe ignore the challenge of our own stereotypes. Now next, we meet the judge, the second character in this parable. And when we think of biblical times, we can think about judges that we know about that time, was that they were considered to be corrupt, that they were able to be bribed. People could come into the court with their friends and try to advocate for them. And it was really about who had the most power in order to get what you needed out of the court system. And so we don't have a good sense, though, of this judge either. We don't know if he's really that corrupt either. We just know that idea of the stereotype of the judges back then. So this parable tells us for a while that he refused her request. And though she keeps coming back, in other words, she does not respect his verdict because it's not the verdict she wants. And so he does not respect or care whether she respects him. He's made his decision, but she is not going to give up and she keeps coming back. And so we know that she must be a strong woman because whenever you keep reading on to the text, it says, because the widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice, lest she wears me out. So if you look at the translation, the Greek would actually transfer from bothering me to she causes me work. And then also, if you were to translate the lest she wear me out, another translation and a better translation, they say, would be beat me up or give me a black eye. So that's a new take, right? Here's this widow coming and then telling the judge that she might beat him up if he doesn't listen and grant her request. So honestly, there's that sense of a threat, and this threat makes the judge take action. He will take care of her plea simply to get rid of her or to avoid a black eye. So we have learned that his decision really is not based on merit of her case. This is not justice, it's intimidation. The line of I will grant her justice in the Greek, it literally means I will avenge her. The widow gets what she wants, which was vengeance. And the judge, whether you find him a likable character or not, is co-opted and made an accessory to her plea and her plan. So it's a very interesting take for us when we take that time and look at that. Because it wasn't that he was motivated, motivated by doing the right thing. It was because he was either just too tired, apathetic, or just wanted to have it be over. We can kind of relate to the judge in this parable. We probably would never have thought that we would feel that way. But we feel it whenever we are having to continue on in this pandemic. We're tired. We're over having to make those hard decisions about holidays that are coming up. We're tired of seeing what's going on in our school districts and that fear that is around us and concern for others. And so we are getting to the point of fatigue and less so we feel threatened. Um, we feel tired and we are just feeling kind of threatened by everything around us. But the story ends with the judge's decision and thus the parable ends the story about potential corruption, violence, and vengeance. Justice is not clearly rendered. 
And so when we start looking at them a little further and understand it, we have to start asking ourselves, well, then what does this mean about praying always? How does that connect into this? And so I think part of this message of digging deeper allows us to know that we need to be praying so our hearts can be changed. And often when we're praying, we allow God to come in and live inside of our hearts. We need God to be persistent in our lives as well, so that way our hearts become tired and worn out to where there is only God living in it. That we don't hold on to the earthly things and that we continue to move in a way that allows our faith to be moved out. Because we cannot change scripture, but scripture changes us. And this is what we need. We need our hearts to be so open to having God be present and allow ourselves to break down those walls around us. We no longer need to think about the stereotypes of others because once our stereotypes of others are shattered, we can begin to look at people as individuals and get to know them on their level. We can take this parable at face value and really live into that prayer life. But I think there's that deeper meaning there for us to continue to pray so that our hearts can be transformed. The same goes for us to be persistent in building our relationships with one another and to allow God to break down those walls. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The next hymn is Lift Every Voice and Sing. You are invited at this time to be in a time of reflection and prayer and allow your hearts to turn to God in this moment. Son and Holy Spirit. 